The Old Testament lesson appointed for the second Sunday after Christmas is recorded in the book of 1 Kings, the third chapter we pick up at the fourth verse. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon said, You've shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and you've given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people? Now it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you've asked this, and you have not asked for for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but you've asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, just as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and he offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings, and he made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, the second chapter. We pick up at the 40th verse. Now, the child, Jesus, grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today's gospel lesson is one that typically raises a lot of questions. And this is good. It actually shouldn't be surprising. After all, I don't find it coincidental at all that this is exactly how we see our Lord teaching those learned teachers in the gospel text today. I mean, even as a boy, Jesus is fully God. That means he doesn't need instruction in the word of God. He is the word of God, right? He is the very wisdom of God in the flesh. Okay, so why does Jesus ask all these questions of the teacher, then? The answer is pretty simple. Basically, Jesus is teaching these men by using what we now call the Socratic method, made famous by a guy named Socrates. Um, The Socratic method basically breaks down to the master teaches by asking the students questions. And the students are brought to a correct understanding by having to think about those questions and having then to give sound, reasonable, logical answers in return. 
You know, in this particular case, as we see in the gospel lesson, the students, i.e. the learned religious leaders, they're being questioned by the young master. And it, it certainly makes sense when you think about it. None of these guys would have listened to a 12-year-old boy lecture them, but they would willingly answer all his questions during you know, a Bible study. Little did they know that they were the ones who were actually being taught. By asking all these questions, Jesus was basically getting these guys to think about the reasons that they believe, teach, and confess what they do. Did, did what they believe sync up with what God actually said? Were their beliefs and their practices, were they in line with God's word, or, or was there maybe a, a little disconnect? Were things not quite adding up? Were, were things not making sense? See, this is why your Lord Christ, in all wisdom and all mercy, this is why he was asking these learned men so many questions. Perhaps the reason why this text raises so many questions for us is because, well, perhaps our Lord is still teaching us in much the same way. But here's the deal, though. There simply aren't enough hours in the day to address all the questions that arise out of this text. Uh, certainly not today in sermon format, at least. So for brevity's sake, let's, let's hit on a couple of main questions. We're told that Jesus increased in wisdom and maturity and favor with God and with man. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, first off, how does omniscient Jesus increase in wisdom? Well, you need to remember that Jesus was also 100% man. So as a young lad, he, he did still have a lot to learn, not in terms of divine wisdom. That was always 100%. Jesus was always omniscient God. But he did have a lot to learn in terms of the wisdom of maturity, right? The wisdom that, that one gains or one acquires as they grow from childhood into adulthood, and, and make no mistake, that's what the text says here in the original language. It's not just that Jesus grew in stature, okay? It's not just that he got taller and filled out. No, he matured physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, the same way we do. Think about it from your own life experiences. Our priorities do tend to change as we get older. We mature. Typically, certainly not always, as is the case with certain immature fools, but typically, maturity brings with it a, a certain wisdom. Okay? Maturity and wisdom, they go hand in hand. Maturity brings with it a, a sense of responsibility, a sense of duty and obligation. At least it's supposed to. Maturity means having the wisdom to know that you need to do what's necessary. You need to do what's right, even though you may not want to do it. You know, like, like go to work and pay your bills. So did the boy Jesus grow and mature? Yeah, he did. He, he grew into a man in every sense of the word. Okay, next question then. What, what does the wisdom and maturity of faith look like? What does it sound like? What's most important to one who is wise and mature in their faith? Well, I know as it pertains to Jesus, we can look right to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Mere hours before his crucifixion. We can look there as a prime example of what faithful maturity and wisdom looks like and sounds like. You know, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup of suffering from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Guys, that's the wisdom of faith. That's the maturity of faith. Jesus is doing what needs to be done. And understand, out of a pure and incomprehensible divine love, Jesus, is, he willingly gave up all of heaven's majesty for a cross. He willingly sacrificed his life in order to redeem our lives. As fully omniscient God, Jesus knew full well what was needed to, to satisfy that impossible debt of sin. Only the blood of the righteous one can make atonement for sin. Jesus knew that he must suffer the righteous, hellish wrath of God if we children of Adam were going to be saved. But don't forget, he was also fully man. He is also fully man. 
Nobody wants to suffer. I mean, we don't even want to be disliked or inconvenienced. Um, you know, it's not crazy. It's not wrong to say that Jesus, in all his humanity, it, it's not wrong to say that he didn't want to suffer the hellish wrath of his heavenly Father. And yet, still, he did it, didn't he? Willingly. He knew what needed to be done, and he did it. He put his Father's will first. This is what the wisdom and maturity of faith looks like and sounds like. This is the wisdom and maturity of faith in action. Like I said, we can see it in the Garden of Gethsemane. But, but even here in the temple as a 12-year-old boy, even here, we're already bearing witness to a profound maturity of faith. You know, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? The innocence of that response almost overshadows the profound maturity of that response. You know, you know well, duh, mom, where else would I be? What do you mean you were searching everywhere under the sun for me? Why wasn't this the first place you looked? I mean, where else would I be? This is what faithful men do. And, and there's a reason I say that. Okay, we need to remember the text tells us Jesus was 12 years old. Now, as a 12-year-old Jew, Jesus would have already gone through his bar mitzvah, meaning that in terms of the faith, Jesus was considered to be a man. He was a mature man in his faith. His faith was his. Okay, Jesus was responsible as a 12-year-old young man. Jesus was responsible for making sure that his faith was fed and nourished and put into proper practice. If only, quote-unquote, more mature adults had such a faithful, mature mindset. You know, again, mom, this is what faithful men do. They gather around the word of God. They're in the house of their father. Where else would they be? They're out of the mouths of babes, right? Now, this, this all raises some big questions for the person in the mirror. First off, what about you, right? What does the wisdom and maturity of faith look like? What does it sound like? What's most important to a person who is wise and mature in their faith? Could you be accused of being wise and mature in the faith? Or do you maybe still have a lot of growing up and learning to do? Look, I've said it many times before. I'll say it again. Right here, you look to this altar, this pulpit, this font. Here is Almighty God right where he promises to be. And he's doing exactly what he promises to do. Right here, here is where Almighty God himself is bringing heaven to meet earth. Right here in your very presence, right? Right here in his holy house. Here is God's feast of forgiveness and grace and mercy. And, and it's all for you overflowing and unconditional. Those who are wise and mature in the faith, well, they know their sinful reality. And they also know this Christ-centered, grace-filled reality. Those who are wise and mature in the faith, they know what's truly important. They know what needs to come first in life over everything else, even over the things that you probably want to do more. However, when you truly understand your sinful reality, when you truly understand what God is actually doing here in and through these means of grace, it's not even a matter of doing what you have to do, even though you don't want to do it. I mean, coming into God's holy house, coming into God's presence here to receive his free gifts of grace, mercy, and love, and forgiveness, you know, it's not like having to wake up and go to work on a Monday morning. It's not like, oh, I have to go to the gym. I have to pay the mortgage. You know, I'd rather blow my money on something fun. Coming to church is not like, oh, I have to go to the dentist for an annual exam. Guys, look, I get it. Nobody wants to do those things. But you know, you need to do those things. And I know the old Adam in all of us struggles to come to church. He really doesn't want to come to church, certainly as often as church is offered, at least. I mean, you may not want to admit that, but that doesn't make it any less true. Understand, it is commendable that you, know, you still get out of bed, you still come to be in the presence of the Lord. 
that's just what mature Christians do, right? Mature Christians made wise in the faith. That's just what we do. We don't always like it, but we do it. We do it because this is what's most important. And those immature in the faith, they can't say that. And the fruits that they bear, the excuses that they offer up, that all, con they, they, it all confesses the truth of their immature foolishness. But you know what? It, true wisdom and maturity of faith sees things differently. Okay? Like I was saying, the wisdom and maturity of faith doesn't have to come to church at all. It's not a matter of, I have to do this. It's not a chore. It's not a demand. No, man, this is a joy. It's a privilege. It's another God-given opportunity to be in the presence of God, to receive his good gifts from his hand. The wisdom and maturity of faith wants all that Jesus it can get. And I confess, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, I still have a lot of maturing and wising up to do in that sense. Lord have mercy. Now, one final question before we call it a day here. What does it mean when it says here that Jesus increased in favor with both God and with man? Well, think about it in terms of the world you live in, the world you work in and play in. There are many people in this world today who seem to have it all. Now, has God blessed them in their prosperity? Yeah, actually, he has. Does it mean, does all that prosperity mean that they found favor in his eyes? No, not necessarily. You need to remember, God causes the rain to fall upon the righteous as well as the unrighteous. There are plenty of foul unbelievers in this world who've been blessed with the very best that all this world has to offer. In man's eyes, those folks, they are truly favored, right? Right? Without faith, those people, as great and smart and beautiful and wealthy as they may be, without faith, they're outside of salvation. If you're outside of salvation, guess what? You are outside of God's good favor. Conversely, flip side, there are plenty of very faithful people in this world who seem to have gotten every raw deal, every bad hand dealt to them that life could possibly dish out. However, in the midst of all that pain and suffering, in the midst of all of that, there's still a vibrant living faith in Christ Jesus. And you know, God looks on this person and he calls them favored. The rest of the world looks on them, they see nothing but cursed or, or, or bad luck or you know somebody who's been forsaken by God. The rest of the world does not look with favor upon those people. They're shunned. You don't even want to make eye contact with them. But God looks at them and calls them holy and precious in his sight. See, this is where the angel's Christmas pronouncement to the shepherds, keeping watch over their fields, their flocks by night, this is where that, that message intersects with humanity. It's where this message begins to make sense. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace upon whom his favor rests. You need to think about that for a moment. There is peace, which, a peace that surpasses all understanding. There is peace for those on whom God's favor rests. Now that peace is only understood in the wisdom and maturity of faithfulness. God's favor rests upon those who have faith. Those who, in the wisdom and maturity of faith, know the peace that surpasses all understanding. They know the peace that's known only in Christ Jesus. They know that they are favored in Christ and because of Christ. And you know what? That's how we're going to wrap this up for today. With all the focus right where it needs to be. On the peace that is Jesus Christ. May God grant you in this new year, may he grant you the wisdom and the maturity of faith. The wisdom and maturity and peace that comes with simply trusting with the childlike faith. <laughs> kind of ironic, right? Wisdom and maturity is recognized in a childlike faith. But may God grant you this wisdom, this maturity, this peace, as you trust simply, like a child, trust wholeheartedly that you are favored. His favor rests upon you because of the all-atoning work and person of Jesus Christ alone. To him be all the glory, praise, and honor. Amen.